pasión para mi gente Con una pasión Saludos, it's Gabe Morales returning back for our series on Texas Hispanic prison gangs. I will likely break all of these gangs down further in future episodes, but I wanted to give you a basic primer first. Just as I've interviewed some TS and Califas in Washington State, I've ran into some Texas Mexican Mafia in Washington State jails and other institutions. Some have been housed in the SeaTac BOP facility that I still pass by weekly. I've talked to staff who work there and had direct communications with their intel staff over the years. This facility places inmates from all over the United States, including individuals from Texas. I am currently a lieutenant at an unspecified facility in the Seattle-Tacoma area, dealing with illegals from all over the world, particularly from Mexico, who often belong to prison gangs. And my insight and advice is called upon daily by many members of U.S. law enforcement agencies. In 2015, I was asked by ASA TV in San Antonio to analyze a case where a local cop was killed by what was believed to be Texas Mexican Mafia members. I was referred to the KSAT program director, Nicole Nikki Perez, by former Yakima, Washington Police Chief Sam Granado, who I remained in contact with over the years, even when he moved back to San Anto. Right away with my past training, I recognized there were some Texas Mexican Mafia ties. I was flown down to San Antonio with a TV station feature me in a week-long series, Special Reports, on the Texas Mexican Mafia. An off-duty Balcones Heights police officer named Julian Piscina was gunned down on May 4th, 2014 by a masked gunman, apparently ordered by the Texas Mexican Mafia. Piscina co-owned a tattoo shop and was suspected of dealing drugs to keep it afloat. Michicaneme, or Texas Mexican Mafia members, taxed him the dime which is 10% of the take, then killed him, despite the fact that it appears they knew he was a cop. I told KSAT that Piscina displayed tattoos and clothing associated with the mafia, and they likely felt he was playing both sides of the game, and it ultimately cost him his life. Shot caller Ruben Menes Reyes was arrested in November 2014 for three murders and was soon charged with ordering the death of Piscina. In 2016, Reyes was sentenced to five consecutive life sentences in federal prison for his role in Piscina's death and others. But Piscina was not the only officer with ties to the Texas Mexican Mafia over the years. A former Bexar County deputy in San Antonio was arrested in 2019, and three members of the Texas Mexican Mafia were indicted on drug possession and bribery charges. Armando Trevino was indicted on six criminal charges by a Bexar County grand jury. They included engaging in criminal activity, bribery, prohibited substances, and introducing items in a correctional facility, as well as three drug possession charges. Officials stated the surveillance team observed a narcotics transaction taking place, and they swooped in and placed both under arrest. One ended up being a drug dealer and one the officer. Authorities stated the deputy was in uniform at the time of the arrest, and he had a weapon present. Although he was not an official peace officer, it was clear to everybody that he was on his way to work to smuggle these drugs into the Bexar County Jail, but was placed under arrest before that could be completed. It is believed the deputy had been smuggling drugs into the jail for quite a while. Trevino resigned a month after he was arrested. Outsiders are often suspicious of cops as being crooked and dirty, and incidents like these don't help. But it has been my experience that most cops do their jobs professionally and diligently. Sometimes it may appear that they are too close to criminals, but if you're working undercover, this is part of your job. You just have to never forget which side you're on. Texas gang investigator Robert Mokomurill, who is my dear friend and mentor, and several other gang task force members told me they would often go to the same hangouts as Texas MA members, and they would wave to each other and smile and laugh back and forth. This was common to show respect for your adversary and let them know it was never personal if you arrested them or put them in the hole. It was only business. The Texas Mexican Mafia or Mexicaneme is not to be confused with the Mexican Mafia of California, 
While they have some common characteristics and origins, they are separate groups. The Mexican Neme Constitution was written by founder and president Heriberto Herb Muelas Huerta, who is still housed at the ADX Federal Prison in Florence, Colorado. The Constitution states, in being with a criminal organization, we will function in any respect or criminal interest for the benefit or advancement of the M.A. We will traffic in drugs, contracts of assassinations, prostitution, robbery of high magnitude, and anything we can imagine. So it was pretty clear what they were about. The Mexican Neme was originally formed in the Retrieve Unit in the early 1980s in Texas and founded by members who were disrespected by the Texas Syndicate. And although they were first victims of the TS, I think it's fair to say they became a greater force in later years. The Mexican Neme continues to be the security threat group within the Texas Department of Corrections. The Mexican Mafia of Texas continues to engage in criminal activities inside and out. The Mexican Neme stronghold, which they call the Capital de Aslan, is San Antonio, Texas, or San Anto. The city is also called La Oreja. The Mexican Neme has used different tactics in the past for its criminal operations and even tried to use religion as cover under the guise of the Mexican Neme Science Temple of Aslan Incorporated. They did learn and used Aztec language, or Nahuatl, in their coded correspondences and tattoos and drawings. President and founder Herb Huerta is very fluent in Nahuatl, and he was very close to members of the California Mexican Mafia while he was housed in Lompoc, BOP, in late 1979 to early 1980. In fact, the Texas Mexican Mafia Constitution starts with, we represent the Mexican Mafia here in Texas and recognized California MA co-founder Cheyenne Cadena is even mentioned in their oath, which convinced just about anybody about where their roots come from. Herb Huerta was a heroin addict while out in the streets of San Antonio, and in the early 1970s, he was influenced by the Chicano movement. He adopted certain aspects of Mexican history and culture of the Aztecs and made this a central theme of his organization. In the days of the Templo de Aslan, he was referred to as Daystar. Huerta's success in the heroin trade was based on marriages to major drug families in San Antonio. A lot of these families were part of the Fred Carrasco organization, which operated the city in the 1970s, and several members eventually became part of the Mexican Navy. Benito Alonso was vice president of the group. He had been a couple for Carrasco. Benito was given a life sentence in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice for a 1974 incident of smuggling in a handgun. The gun was smuggled in to assist Carrasco in his attempt to escape, which quickly became a hostage shootout. Carrasco, which at the time was the longest hostage situation in the U.S. The first major lockdown concerning prison gangs occurred due to a Texas Department of Criminal Justice war between the TS and the Mexican M.A. The original high command of the M.A. were in retrieve at the same time between 1984 and 85. And the group quickly grew throughout the system. Soon they outnumbered the TS. The war started late 1984 with multiple armed assaults. Assaults continued, climaxing during the Labor Day weekend of 1985, when at the Darrington unit, also called El Dragon, two members of the TS entered a crowded day room armed with butcher and boning knives from the unit kitchen and suddenly attacked and killed three members of the Texas Army. Two additional homicides were committed the same weekend as the killing at Darrington. TDCJ then ordered a system-wide lockdown until every gang member, suspect, and associate was identified and was placed in administrative segregation, also known as the whole. The Mexican name has now been around for over 40 years. Herb Huerta no longer calls the shots directly because of the stranglehold by federal BOP on his activities. While on the other hand, Bonito Alonso carried out day-to-day operations since his operations were not as closely monitored. Some of the younger Mexican name have questioned Herb's leadership in the past, and end up dead. Herb is still president of the organization in spite of attempts to fool law enforcement by saying that he was retired. There had been some indication that Herb gave reins to the old man, Reynaldo El Rey Ramirez. Ramirez was the clear winner of BOP-wide elections, even though there were a few that contested his leadership, like Ernest Termite Garcia. El Rey was very well respected and still is considered a senior advisor. He was released from the BOP on March 22nd, 2019, when he was nearly 80 years old. While the Texas MA may not be as powerful as it once was, it is still a force to be reckoned with in Tejas and in the BOP. 
Other leaders in the prison gang have been Daniel Gumbileza, David Blackie Angiano, and Thomas Clyde Marquez, as well as Joe Pistolas Lopez and Jacinto Cache Navejar, who was a street general until he was arrested. In this picture, we see Cache attending the wedding of fellow MA Captain Oliver Flacker Gonzalez, who's in charge of part of Southwest Texas for the MA and was killed in March of 2005 by La M. As Herb Huerta stated, when he first started the organization, we will traffic in drugs, contracts of assassinations, prostitution, robbery of high magnitude, and anything we can imagine. And indeed, they have. The Front Street Massacre in San Antonio was very violent, and the KSAT staff brought me to the exact location where five people were murdered on the orders of M.A. General Robert B.V. Perez in August 1997. Perez was later given a death sentence, but it wasn't for the brutal West French Place killings. While the feds linked him to the massacre and 10 other gang-sanctioned hits in a federal trial, he only received the death penalty for his involvement in the murders of two rival Texas Mexican Mafia members in the 1994 shootout. Perez remained a general in the gang until he was executed by the state of Texas in 2007. His final words were, I'm ready, warden. I got my boots on, like a cowboy. While the Texas Mexican Mafia might not be as powerful as it once was, it is still a force in Tejas and in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Los Hermanos de Pistoleros Latinos, which means Brotherhood of Latin Gunmen, is a gang that operates in most prisons and out on the streets in many communities, especially in South Texas, in the greater Laredo area. A Texas inmate named Alfredo Chino Avitia founded the HPL in the mid-1980s and later appointed Jorge Gato Solo as his successor when Avitia paroled. Due to serious internal problems, such as rank appointments and recruitment, Solo and Gregorio Goyo Lopez had a dispute which caused a split within the organization. Solo's followers became known as the 45s, Los Fieles, and Lopez followers became known as the 1612s, or Los, Los Verdaderos. Los Hermanos de Pistoleros Latinos, the HBL, began to multiply in the 1990s after the gang began recruiting members from cities outside of southern Texas and the Rio Grande Valley. In time, these original HPL members resented new members being recruited from San Anto and Houston. The HPL remained relatively low profile until 1999 when both factions reunited, and officials estimate there are about 1,000 HPL active today. In March of 2000, the HPL declared a war on the Texas Syndicate by killing a TS member at the Coalfield Unit. In September 2000, HBO members from San Anto killed and burned the bodies of a Texas Mexican Mafia member, a female MA associate, and a white associate of the MA in a drug deal gone badly. In late May 2008, federal and local law enforcement arrested two dozen members and associates of the HBL who were charged with conspiracy to transport large amounts of cocaine from Laredo to Houston and laundered the drug money proceeds. HBL is also active in several cities in Mexico, in particular Nuevo Laredo. Members maintain close ties to several Mexican DTOs and are involved in trafficking large amounts of drugs from Mexico into the United States. Even though there was a lot of bad blood from the 2000 murders and burning of members, a peace treaty was arranged with the Texas Mexican Mafia and the HPL that is still in place as far as I know. It is interesting to me that the HPLs will allow females to hold rank. These female members are often referred to as being balas or bullets, and they conduct a lot of business for the gangs. In fact, females do this for many gangs, but they are not always allowed to be members. TDCJ started tracking the Rasunida prison gang in 1991. The Raza Unida has no association with other groups that have Raza or Unida in their name. The RU are based in Corpus Christi, Texas, and are estimated to have over 300 members. Their official colors are black and blue. In 1992, the Mexicaneme instigated a brief war with the weaker Raza Unida. Three members of the Raza Unida were killed in attack from the Mexican Mafia at the Coalfield State Prison. During this conflict, the Raza Unida had no choice but to join an alliance with the Texas Syndicate. This basically meant they gave the Texas Syndicate part of control over corpus. 
And as a result, the TS protected the Raso Unida. In 1994, the TS and Raso Unidas wanted to take over Brownsville, Texas, which was a drug route that was being run by a rival prison gang, Los Hermanos de Pistoleros Latinos. After five years of war, they reached an agreement with that all three gangs would share the drug trade in Brownsville by dividing the city into sections. In 1995, the Rasunina began to multiply after war erupted between the TS and the Barrio Azteca. The Rasunida refused to get involved in the war or to assist the Texas Syndicate. Instead, the RU severed its alliance with the Texas Syndicate and declared complete independence. This infuriated members of the TS, who felt the gang owed them. But at the time, the TS could not afford to retaliate much against the RUs, so they let them be and the gang grew and was able to gain control of some areas in the Pitas and on the Calles. Raso Nida's newfound power did not last long. In July 1997, the Texas Syndicate regained power and control of the prison system drug trade. During these years, it became known to the TS that the RUs were importing drugs from Brownsville via Matamoros and trafficking it to the Dallas and Houston areas, which was predominantly TS territory. In late March of 2002, RU members assaulted and killed a TS member at the Polunsky unit, and lockdowns were ordered for all known or suspected TS and RU members. A full-scale gang war erupted between both gangs, which spread straight-wide into such cities as Corpus Christi, San Antonio, Dallas, and Houston. The RU suffered great losses and was on the verge of collapse when a conflict arose amongst ranking members of the RU. The RU, Dallas, and Southern Texas members split into factions, and the two could not reach an agreement or peace treaty. The majority faction is now called RU Sureños, and the minority faction from Dallas remained Raso Unida. And there were some RU who remained neutral in this dispute. This split caused a loss of morale for many of the organization's original members, and many quit the game. I'd like to hear from some of you about the RU conflicts today and where they stand. El Paso, Texas is also called El Chuco or Chuco Town. And like I said before, it was once a stronghold for the Texas Syndicate. Some of the original and arguably most violent TS members were originally from EPT. The Barrio Aztecas organized in 1984 with official rules adopted in 1987 at the Coldfield Unit, and they quickly moved out to the streets. According to gang expert, Mary Lou Carillo, who grew up in the area, some original members included Benito Benia Costa, Alberto Indio Estrada, Benjamin Titap Alvarez, Manuel El Grande Fernandez, Raul Ravlio Piero, Manuel Longo Torres, Jose Gitano Chavez, Carlos Chacan Perea, and possibly Alejandro Blackie Marufo. Acosta and possibly Fierro were from the X-14 gang. They had nothing to do with the California umbrella group known as Norteños 14. The Barrio Aztecas were designated as a disruptive group in 1993 by the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Members were originally addressed as being indios or carnales, and they would often use the Nahuatl language to communicate in code and put on Aztec tattoos and make Aztec drawings. At one time, they used feathers to indicate rank but I don't think that's any longer the case. Let me know if that is true. Like I said, members were often referred to as being Indios, Flechas, Washington Redskins, or any other terms which referred to Indians, such as the ones who wear moccasins. Getting your guaraches, your sandals, can be code for becoming a made Barrio Azteca member. They also sometimes use the code 21 for the second and first letter of the alphabet, BNA, for Barrio Azteca. An inmate named Alfredo Ordonez was placed in the El Paso County Detention Center in Tank 550, which had 23 inmates in it that violated state jail standards on overcrowding. Ordonez was said to be a member of the Texas Syndicate. There were also known Barros Teca members in the tank. Ordonez requested to be transferred via a kite to another tank, but that was rejected according to court documents. Ordonez was then brutally attacked by the Barros Teca. He was kicked punched, his head was then thrust against an iron object, causing severe head trauma, and he received a stab wound on the left side of his head. He was taken to the hospital, but on March 25th, 1994, Ordinus died of his injuries, and his family filed a lawsuit against the jail.
The event started a series of assaults by the Texas Syndicate on the Barrio Azteca and the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, and eventually on anyone from West Texas. The Barrio Aztecas went to war with the Texas M.A. over the Mexican M.A., killing a Barrio Azteca member named Oscar Little Puppet Juarez at the Clemens Unit of TDCJ in late 1994. Today, there is a standing peace treaty between the Aztecas and the Mexican Mafia. It was signed in 1997, as well as a peace treaty that was established with the Texas Syndicate. The Aztecas have a close working relationship with the Juarez cartel. In fact, there may be more Juarez Azteca members now in Mexico than in the U.S., totaling about 3,500. The membership in Juarez rose fast post-year 2000 after they started working as sicarios, hitmen in Brazo Armada, armed for the Juarez cartel. But at first, Barrios Teca were just mules and medium-level dealers for the Juarez cartel. A former corrections official in Juarez, Pablo Cajigal Angel, tells us exactly how they developed their working relationship. The gangsters, like, Bar like Barrios Tecas, were only drug mules at a lower level. They were not an armed force at first or anything. They were only low-level narcotics traffickers and mules to bring it across the border. What they did was, because some of them had dual citizenship as Americans and Mexicans, is then it was easy for them to cross the border back and forth. They had a heroin drug line. Era lo que this was a connection ah, and business venture. De la Chiva, sí. de la Chiva. Iban y venían, iban they acquired from the Juarez cartel. cartel de, but they did most of their business. De, de y más bien el negocio para the ellos, Paso, Texas. Aztecas, Barrio Azteca, era Not en el Paso, Texas. Era el negocio, That is where they did their ellos. main drug no business. En el Juárez, they only Juárez, came to Juarez to get drugs, then took off back to, to El Paso because it was more economically lucrative for them over there. We will have the full interview with Mr. Cajigal that tells more about Barrios Tech activity in Juarez in a later episode on this channel. That will be done in Spanish. Like other prison gangs, the Barrios Tech makes much of its money off the tax on drug shipments and sales by other gangs. This is often called the dime which is 10% of all narcotic sales. Gangs are obligated to kick in this tax or be targeted or ripped off. Basically, it's like protection money. The longtime Barrio Azteca leader or Capo Mayor, Benjamin Tita Pavarez, died on August 4th, 2020 in the federal BOP. There were some members of the Barrio Azteca that started doing their own thing for a while and decided to start recruiting without going through the proper channels. This caused a lot of problems. When young kids started tagging Barrio Azteca, committing drive-by shootings, and bringing unwanted attention from police on the gang. The upper echelon also found out that this faction was not forwarding any money from dope cells, and so they were put on bad status. The guys responsible for this were Rafael Pelon Martinez Vasquez, Alejandro Pelucas Roman. Pelucas was arrested by police in Juarez and incarcerated at the violent El Cerezo jail and is now deceased. Meanwhile, Pelon and Shotgun were incarcerated in the federal BOP. Pelon was stripped of his rank and juice, but was said to still be active in the San Antonio area. When the Barrio Azteca leadership wants somebody dead, it usually doesn't take very long. A past leader or couple of the Barrio Aztecas in Apostle was David Chicho Mérez, who was found murdered in early 2008. Chicho was a known hothead and a bully, so he was not well liked by Barrio Aztecas working under him. He was also a tecato, so he was often careless when under the influence of chiva, heroin. Higher-ups in the organization suspected he was not forwarding Barrio's Teca proceeds and keeping some of their cut. In response to some of the missing feria money, he had his crews set up quota collections, and they were involved in several shootings and murders. The gang caught the attention of law enforcement and was targeted, and the Aztecas killed Chicho as they expected he might snitch against them if arrested. As Mr. Cajigal stated, beginning in the 2000s, Barrios Tecas started to assist Mexico's Juarez cartel with operations, and the gang became an important element in the battle with the Sinaloa cartel for control of the city. The Juarez armed wing La Dinea recruited members from Barrios Teca in about 2008, and many gang members were killed or arrested 
on all sides. In 2010, Barrio Azteca members allegedly murdered 15 teenagers at a party. And later that same year, they killed a U.S. consulate employee, her husband, and the husband of another employee in Ciudad Juarez. The attacks brought down a great deal of pressure from the U.S. government, which issued a federal indictment against 35 Barrio Azteca members in March 2011. Ten of those 35 were specifically indicted in connection with the 2010 consulate murder case. This provided the FBI with an opportunity to make a RICO indictment against the gang. Previously, in January 2008, multiple Barrio's tickets were arrested on a RICO case, including Titap Alvarez, Shotgun Perea, Adam Sergio Munoz, and Roberto Nado Duran. Gustavo Tayo Gallardo turned on his gang and decided to cooperate and testify at the trial. Barrio Azteca heavyweight Manuel Tordon Cordoza from El Paso was incarcerated in the BOP on the case, and the top capo in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice is currently said to be Ricardo Giesis Vasquez. In 2008, Mexican police arrested a member of the Azteca's Maro Talamantes Vela after he stabbed Manuel Istas who was a member of the rival Los Machicles gang. In addition to Barrio Aztecas, Mr. Kahiga will tell us in a later episode how the Barrio Aztecas Mexicles dispute evolved. As I said, the BAs are no longer at war with the Titisk Syndicate in Chukotown. They have been in odds in the past with Paisas, Mexicles, Partido Revolucionario Mexicano, and the Chukotango, although there is a grudging truce with all these parties at the present moment. The Barrio Aztecas also control many parts of Chukotown. The Aztecas have long sent out a message to other gangs in the city that Segundo Barrio is their hood and their barrio, and they are main drug connection from Mexico into the U.S. A Barrio Azteca leader in Juarez, Eduardo Tablas Revela, was arrested in 2018, and the gang splintered even further. And so the saga continues for Barrio Aztecas, who continue to deal heavily in heroin and conduct their business out on the streets and inside our jails and prisons. Prison gangs like the Texas Syndicate, Texas Mexican Mafia, Barrio Aztecas, and others are still around, but many of the membership have aged. They have been greatly impacted by RICO cases, as well as difficulty in recruiting quality recruits from the younger generation who often don't like to be bossed around. A group called the Tangos in Texas have very few rules and no hierarchy, which many youngsters find very attractive. I will cover the Tangos in our next episode. For now, this is Gabe Morales signing off for Gangsters, Cops, and Politicians.